Well, hello, babe. How are you? Oh, my God. What an honor. Long-time <laughs> listener, first-time caller. <laughs> and to be in it, I've heard your voice so much and enjoyed your voice so much that to get to be in dialogue with that voice, to get to be called babe, what a thrill. I'll tell you what I have been enchanted by, and that what? is Catherine Colberti. And I mean, if you can say what is on the tin, it is amazing medieval girl who gets her period but it's so much more of that and i mean i'm more of a tudor girl myself and Berlin's my home girl but i'm here for it like who knew medieval times was so funny and i just love how low the standards of dating are in it that a fit man is just someone who has all their teeth i'm like <laughs> it was a fit simpler man is time who has all their teeth so simple all their teeth and like no like go- open go- goiters or boils like it was and maybe someone who was gonna live past 25 oh, tick 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 t- <laughs> tick you got it so do i i also <laughs> like that it was a time where being like a curvier woman was a sign of ample health and opportunity like there's a lot for us in the medieval times but um but it was really interesting also to think about the fact that like when you're a teenager in the medieval world, you're you've gone through such a larger percentage of your life because your life expectancy mm. was about 40. Like people who lived to be 60 were considered wise old crones. So, you know, like every one of the real housewives would be dead already. Like it's just wild. When you actually pull it in that perspective, it makes it even more wild of a time. That's the kind of detail, those are the details we need to make history make sense. It's like, <laughs> hey, if you were alive in 1290, the Real Housewives would all be dead already. Oh, I get history. <laughs> I think especially for female creators and female voices and female directors, I mean, we've even seen it recently with Libra Wild, for instance, people just yeah. love to tear women down. And it's so overtly sexist. I mean, we're all open to criticism. We've all done things we necessarily wouldn't want, should have done differently. And that's fair. But then the criticism can be so heavily sexist. Do you think that female directors and creators are still held to a higher account than what male auteurs are? 1000%. And I think anyone who does not represent the kind of cis white male majority in Hollywood is held to a different standard. I think people are made to feel like if you mess this up, then it's going to be your last opportunity. Or if whatever you're doing, you have to represent everybody else who looks like you or shares your same gender identity. And I think that, of course, we have all done things that we wish we could have done differently. And that constructive criticism is really healthy. But I think the thing that has upset me in in what I've witnessed around the Olivia Wild stuff is just the glee that people have in the kind of gotcha glee that people have. Um, and I do think that it's it can be more intense when it comes to um, women in the public eye, but I also think it can be more intense when it comes to queer people and people of color and that the best thing that we can all do is band together and noticing it and supporting each other and you know i think that it's so also upsetting to just see like the thin line between obsessive fandom on the internet that turns to something so much darker because people who purport to have so much love for someone can then just shift and in that way i feel lucky that while people know about my work i've never been on a scale where i would receive that kind of mass pandemonium of attention because I think it's very antithetical to creativity. I don't know that I could continue to have the fluid creative life that I have. I deeply admire, there's some amazingly creative people who do deal with it, but I just, I don't think I have the constitution. Mm. I think it's very interesting because one of the themes of Catherine Coolbirdy as well is this idea of what's deemed as acceptable behavior for a woman. And if you yeah. step outside of that yep. box, you're, you're shunned, you're not normal you're not, you shouldn't be part of society. And I think that so many of us get pushed into these boxes at so many different points in our lives and we try to adapt to those boxes. We try to fit into them. When do you think you've tried to fit yourself into a box or a predetermined stereotype and you kind of look back at now and wish you didn't? Well, it's a great question. And that is so much of what the movie is about, is like being told that there's one way to be a woman that you, I mean, I feel like the character of Birdie, if she existed now, would be questioning 
whether being a woman was even a label that she identified with because mm. I think but I think there's just no space to ask those questions and this is a minor example but I think it's a real one which is like when I started going to public events I had so much fun with fashion I loved getting dressed up I felt like myself I loved having a sense of humor about it trying new things and then I just felt like I was constantly getting this feedback like my clothes like my clothes didn't look right for my body or I wasn't feminine enough or I wasn't glamorous enough and so I kept trying to like fit myself into this mold of like the kind of dress I thought I should wear the kind of makeup I ha thought I should have the kind of hairstyle I thought sh my you know weird messy hair should be oriented into and I look at pictures now of myself in my late 20s and I just think like there's so many moments where I can tell that I'm not having fun at an event that should be for all intents and purposes fun because I'm kind of trying to fit this mold that I will never actually fit and I can just sort of see the sadness in that person and what's been nice about taking some time and then re-emerging is that like now I am finding a way to have fun with all that again and even though you know clothes and makeup aren't the most important part of my job it's just a way to kind of um celebrate where you are and for a long time I wasn't celebrating because I was trying too hard to kind of hide in these other identities and so it's been nice to be like oh no I'm back to kind of not Give, firstly, I think the culture of ripping people's clothes apart, like on Fashion Police and other stuff like that, along with our re-examination of maybe the treatment of women in the 2000s, 90s and 2000s, I think that culture of body shaming and ripping, like Joan Rivers was a goddess, may she rest in peace, she could not have called me fat more times. And it's like that mm. culture of ripping people apart based on their garb based on all of that is really coming is becoming much less prevalent at least in mainstream media and now i'm sort of just back to having fun and that's a really good feeling mm. and i think as well we've changed the dimension of celebrity news in a way that you're allowed to be honest now about what you're actually going through internally and people have far more respect hopefully fingers crossed we can live in a world where you can be honest about what's going on behind closed doors what's going on with your body going on inside internally and one 1, of the things i have percent. so much respect for you about is how open and honest you've been about your health and your endometriosis and being so honest about that Thank and i think you. that i have friends who deal with that go through that have to deal with it on a daily basis and having someone like you who talks about it is so beneficial. Do you feel like being honest about that has helped you be able to deal with it and process what has happened to you? 1000%. And it's helped me feel like I have community. It's funny, my mom always used to be like, why do you talk about these things? It's just too much. Like, I don't want my friends calling and checking in and asking if you're okay. Like, she was much more from the old school of like, we keep these things private. They're not fit for sharing mm. and I said to her it's because it makes me feel like I have a community and for so long she didn't understand and then one day we were outside a doctor's appointment she had come with me to and this young woman came up to me and was like I had to have a full hysterectomy thank you so much for sharing it made me feel so much less alone and my mom looked at me and she was like I get it now and it made it made me feel like I could shed light on an issue that was important which is how underfunded and underexamined women's health is mm. women's reproductive health is and then it also made me feel like I could connect to, um, it made me feel like I could connect to other people in a way. And now I, you know, I probably keep stuff a little closer to the vest than I used to because I'm getting to express so much of it in my work. And because I feel like now that it is more common for people to talk about this stuff, I'm like, oh, it's great. This like new young class of super cool young women is talking about their stuff and probably having more impact than I ever could. But I'm really glad, like, I'm like, oh, it's so cool. Like people know that like Camila Mendez from, you know, Riverdale and Do Revenge has endo, like that's gonna change so many teenagers lives. And so I can kind of hang up my 
raincoat and just be a menopausal grandma over here but it's it was really good for me when it happened and I'm so glad you know plenty of people talk to me who now know the word endometriosis when they didn't even know it before or say to me Mm. I had painful periods and I just thought it was the way that it had to be and I know I get so much from other people being open about their experiences it just lights me up so so I feel lucky that though that's the bright side of social media and and what was beautiful about it for me Mm. and I think what's interesting about endo is that a lot of my friends who I talked to about it and people I've interviewed about it before have said that it really shows how sexist and patriarchal the medical community can still be did you find that oh 1000 percent. I had so many people tell me I was sensitive or needed to get it together or needed to just relax I had someone say just take a glass of wine have a glass of wine before you have sex you'll be fine I mean I had people say things to me where I'm like this person should have their medical license taken away because they're ostensibly a women's health doctor and cannot listen to a woman in pain. And it continues on. And there's so many areas of of the female body that are just unexamined. But, you know, that's, again, that's always been the case for marginalized people. Like, it makes me think about, you know, how anything relating to queer health has always been so taboo Mm. and people don't want to explore you know what is going on when it comes to the health of gay men or when it comes to the health of you know our our trans comrades in arm like it's just really the medical system is designed for straight white men you know there's i i think for me in you know besides my work the most important thing is to try to shed light on illness and addiction and trauma and how they all intersect and how particularly challenging it is to get treatment for those things when you don't sort of fit the mold of who they're doing the majority of medical studies on and for and it makes sense i mean especially in america it's mostly christian white men who are controlling what gets studied and how and speaking of medicine my doctor has texted me four times, so in a moment, I'm going to have to go and talk to her. <laughs> but she makes a very nice segue, because I wish I could gab with you all day, but I've got a puffy knee I need to discuss. Isn't that sexy? <laughs> that is, so- well, babe, I think you're sexy inside and out. I think you're sexy. <laughs> it's the it's the it's the cleavage today, isn't it? The unbuttoned shirt that's really doing it. It's the cleavage for me. <laughs> and before you run off, we always end on this final question, and that always is, in the reign of your life, what is the one rule you'll always live by? What is that rule for you, Lena? Okay, my dad once said to me, go where there's a U-shaped hole for yourself, and I think about it all the time. Another way he put it is, go where it's warm. But, like, I'm not into resistance. I don't like window shopping. I don't like buying things that are too expensive for me. I don't like pushing back and trying to be friends with people who don't like me. Like, I'm like, I want to go where it's warm and where it's safe. And that doesn't mean it's not challenging. And that doesn't mean you're not pushing. But, like, life is hard enough without trying to insert myself into things that don't belong to me or to grab things that weren't made for me. And I feel like if I had to pick one rule and if I was the ruler of the country, I'd be like, let's all reach for what's ours and not push for what's not which doesn't mean be complacent or stay in your lane it just means like if that person over there is not hearing you go somewhere else if that person isn't interested in you you know like if that door is not opening like walk around the back and look for an entrance with a let more jiggly knob like and look for spaces that gratify you and make you feel seen and make you feel cared for because as i said there's enough bullshit